Hello everyone. In this chapter, we are going to talk about liabilities. So what we've done so far in this particular uh, uh, course is we've talked about the accounting cycle. And after the accounting cycle, we had a bunch of chapters dealing with various types of assets. We talked about cash. We talked about accounts receivable. We had a couple of chapters on inventory, and then we talked about plant assets, both tangible as well as intangible plant assets. Well, we've done a pretty good job explaining all the asset side of the balance sheet. Now, in this particular chapter, we're going to talk about the right side of the balance sheet, or at least a portion of the right side of the balance sheet, and that is going to be the liabilities section. Basically, in a nutshell, the liabilities represent the debts of the organization. All liabilities will need to be, be paid back one day, whether current, meaning within the next accounting year, or long term, greater than one year from now, the liabilities will indeed need to be paid back somehow, some way, or at least settled up. Now, businesses can get money in one of two ways. They can finance through getting owner's investments, or they can get loans via liabilities. Either one, um, you're going to see that this is, this is, these are different models. Liabilities eventually mature. Um, they will come due, and they must be paid. Um, the providers of the money, they are called creditors. The owner's equity, as a matter of fact, they never mature. So when an owner invests in the company, they can never expect to get that money back in the long term. Now, they might, but it's not necessarily a maturable event, if that makes sense. They can sell their equity claim, but once it's invested in the corporation, um, it could be long-term in nature, and there's never a date where it definitely matures. The claims of the creditors definitely have legal priority over the claims of the owners. As an example, if a company is about to go bankrupt, the creditors will be paid first. If there's any leftover, if there's any residual, the owners will get that at that point. But definitely the creditors get in line first and they have legal priority. Now, as I said a few minutes ago, liabilities are either current or long term. Current liabilities are those liabilities that are going to get paid back within one year of the balance sheet date. Long-term liabilities, on the other hand, are those liabilities that are due greater than one year from the balance sheet date. A great example of that would be a long-term, let's say, 30-year mortgage on a building. That certainly is long-term. Well, it could it's partly current, right? The, the amounts due in the next year are current and then the remainder are long-term. Long-term liabilities typically bear interest. You usually don't have a liability to a creditor that goes out long-term and they don't expect interest back as well. So this is something that is very common. The interest that is uh, accrued as of the balance sheet date is a liability. The interest to be due in future years is not something that's going to accrue for the balance sheet date. Only the interest that has um, has been due up to that point in time becomes a liability. And we're going to practice this a little bit later. Okay, the next type of liability is an estimated liability. Estimated liabilities, um, they do not have, uh, we don't know exactly what they're going to be. Now, um, they could be something like, as an example, a warranty. Like if a company sells a product and that product comes with a warranty, we don't know which customers are going to come back and actually want to get a new product or a repair under the warranty. That's an example of an estimated liability. Um, now, most liabilities are definite dollar amounts. So what you see on the screen, actually, I know that the, the title of the slide says estimated liabilities, but these are definite liabilities. Um, and they're clearly stated by contract. There's a definite dollar amount. Notes payable, which is basically loans to the bank or somebody else. Accounts payable, this is your normal trade uh, payables and day-to-day -day business. Accrued expenses, 
These are expenses that are accrued at the end of the accounting period um, uh, via the adjustment process that we talked about a few chapters ago. Interest payable, salaries payable. These are examples of adjustments that we will make at the end of an accounting period. Okay. All right. Um, as I was saying, liability classifications, they come in two flavors. Current liabilities are those that are expected to be paid back within one year of the balance sheet date. Um, or long-term liabilities uh, are basically those liabilities that are due greater than one year from the balance sheet date. Here are some examples of current liabilities. You'll always see your accounts payable at the top of the list. Short-term notes payable. The current portion of long-term debt, as an example, let me give you an example for this. Say you have a 30-year mortgage. Any mortgage principal amounts due in the next year is the current piece, and then the rest would be the long-term piece. Accrued liabilities, number four, this, these are those liabilities that we basically uh, adjust at the end of the period. If you recall that adjustment chapter, where we, we look at the, the adjustments at the end of the year. Uh, examples of that, interest payable on any loans, income taxes payable, payroll liabilities. And then, of course, we have number five, unearned revenue. That is the customer deposit. That is when your customers pay you beforehand before you do any work. That clearly needs to be either paid back to the customer or you need to provide a good or a service, whatever you promised that customer. Accounts payable is the normal trade accounts payable for suppliers in the day-to-day -day business. Um, so that is typically what you'll find in accounts payable. Notes payable is a little bit more formal than accounts payable. With notes payable, it's a formal loan. There's usually a lot of paperwork. For those of you that ever signed a loan or entered into a loan, you borrowed money to buy a car, buy a house, or whatever, you understand all the paperwork involved. Typically, it's with the purchase of real estate or some sort of merchandise. Event, And ultimately, the, there's a third bullet point here, which doesn't happen too often, but I should mention it. Sometimes, if our accounts payable gets too old, our vendors may want us to sign a formal note. So sometimes you can convert an account payable into a note payable. A note uh, usually comes with interest. There's not a lot of people out there or organizations out there that are actually going to issue you a loan and not expect any interest back. So here's some journal entries that we can see the example of a note payable. So here we are November 1. We borrowed $10,000. So and this is a six-month loan. So on our first journal entry, when we borrow the note, we're going to debit cash and we will credit the note payable. This increases the asset cash and increases the liability note payable. Now, a couple months go by. I know this is a six-month note, but our financial statements end on December 31. So on December 31, what we need to do is we need to record an adjusting journal entry to accrue for two months' worth of interest. Now, the note was entered into on November 1st, so all of November and all of December went by, and we did not pay back the note. But because we are preparing financial statements as of December 31, we have to accrue two months' worth of interest. Now, there is a formula for interest, and that formula is as follows. Interest equals principal times rate times time. So if you take a look at the bottom of your screen here, I'm kind of circling it down here with my, with my cursor. The principal is $10,000. The interest rate here is 6%. That's an annual interest rate times time. We're talking about two months, so two twelfths of the year went by. If you do the math, that's $100. So the journal entry is going to be, we're going to debit the interest expense all right, to increase the expense, and we're going to credit this liability called interest payable. Now in the next year, let's take a look at this. Four more months go by, so January, February, March, and April. So May 1st, the, the note is due. So on May 1st, we have to pay back not only the $10,000 in principal, 
but also six months worth of interest. So we're going to see, we're going to write a big fat check of $10,300. We're crediting the cash for that amount. But what are we paying back? Well, we're paying back the original note of $10,000. And if you go back to the last slide, you can see that we accrued $100 of interest for November and December. And then this $200 represents the interest for January, February, March, and April. Here's the formula. $10,000 principal times 6% annual interest rate times time, which in this case is four months, four out of 12, four twelfths. There's your $200. And the reason we do this is because we wanna make sure that the expense is recorded in the proper period. Yes, the loan had $300 worth of interest, but $100 of it is actually accrued in, or incurred, I should say, in the prior year with November and December, and in the current year, January through April, it amounts to $200. Okay, uh, current portion of long-term debt, like I said, we can enter into a very long-term debt, like a mortgage loan, then the mortgage is typically paid back over monthly periods or quarterly periods, and the amounts due in the, in the upcoming uh, year that is called a current portion of long-term debt. That would be included in the current liabilities. The remainder is a long-term liability. Accrued liabilities arise in the adjustment process. Um, some examples, as we stated earlier, interest payable on loans. We actually just saw an example of that. Income taxes payable, right? We have to estimate our income taxes um, that are due in the following year. With, uh, with the tax return, but it should be incurred in the current year. And then of course we have payroll liabilities. Our employees may have worked towards the end of the year, but their paycheck may not be for the, the first uh, the week in the next year, um, but we need to incur and record those payroll expenses in the current year. So there are various types of payroll liabilities. We have federal uh, income taxes, possibly state income taxes. If you live in a state that does have an income tax, you might also have a city income tax. If you might work in a large city like New York, and they have, in addition to uh, federal and state, they also have city income taxes. Um, also social security and Medicare taxes are withheld out of the employee's paycheck. Um, in addition to that, the employer needs to match Social Security uh, taxes, so that's an additional expense for the employer. And the employer bears all of the federal unemployment and state unemployment taxes that is not shared with the employee, that is paid 100% by the employer. So there's a lot of payroll liabilities. Uh, the, the organization may also pay workers' comp insurance, um, and they may also have other payroll related costs like health insurance, life insurance, pension plans, and the like. A portion of that is withheld out of the employee's paychecks, but a portion of that, these may also be matched by the employer. Regardless, these are all liabilities. Okay, the next type of liability is called unearned revenue. I always like to tell students to think of unearned revenue as a customer deposit. This is when we receive an advance payment from a customer before we do any work for them. And as we, when we get the money, that is considered a liability. And we're going to credit this liability account called unearned revenue or customer deposit. As we perform the service or, or issue them uh, you know, some goods, uh, as was promised, um, we will reduce the unearned revenue with a debit, and we're going to record the revenue with a credit. But remember, the revenue cannot be recorded until we earn it. All right, so those are good examples of current liabilities. Next, let's move on to long-term liabilities. Long-term liabilities, once again, is when a company um, basically gets a loan most of the time, and it's going to be paid back in greater than one year from the balance sheet date. There are many reasons why a company would enter into a loan. Um, they can fund the startup of the company. 
They can buy a building, buy other assets. They can purchase another company, or they might refinance another long-term liability. Many, many reasons why a long-term liability would be reported by the organization. Some long-term liabilities are actually become, they become due in the current period. When you get closer and closer to that due date, it, that long-term liability can be reclassified to a current liability. However, if management has the intent and the ability to refinance that long-term liability, that has now turned into a current liability. If they are going to, um, to refinance that for financial statement purposes, we can indeed still classify it as a long-term liability. But the company needs to follow through with that uh, intent and ability to refinance it. Okay, now let's take a look at an example. On October 15th of year one, King's Inn purchases furnishings at a cost of $16,398. The loan is an 18-month loan. It's got an interest rate of 12%. And by the way, whenever you see an interest rate stated, it is always an annual rate unless stated otherwise. So in this case, it doesn't state otherwise. So I'm going to say that 12% interest rate is an annual interest rate. The monthly payment is $1,000, and it begins on November 15th. Let's prepare an amortization table. Basically, what an amortization table is, is it takes the unpaid balance. In this case, it's 16398 And every time we make a payment, so the first payment, as we see here, interest period number one, November 15th for $1,000, what this amortization table does is it breaks up the payment between the interest piece and the unpaid principal. Okay, So using our interest formula, we're going to take principal times rate times time. So let's do this. For November 15th, the unpaid principal is 16,398 times interest rate of 12% times time, 1 12th. If you do the math, $16,398 times 12% times 1 12th, you will get $164. So that is the amount of the interest. Well, if the entire payment is 1,000 and $164 of it is going to be interest, that means the difference or $836 reduces the principal. Now my principal balance is no longer 16,398. It's this 16,398 less the 836. So my new principal balance is 15,562. So if we take that 15,562 times 12% times 1 12th, all right, that'll give us our next interest amount, $156. Okay, and we keep going through it until you could see at the end of the period that our unpaid balance is zero. Um, and that is an amortization table. Uh, you will always see that um, the amount of the interest and the reduction in principal will always equal $1,000. Earlier in the loan, you can see that um, um, the principal piece is, is less and the interest piece is more. But as you get towards the end of the loan, the principal piece is more and the interest piece is less. This is true for those of you that own a mortgage. When you're in the beginning of the mortgage, you feel very defeated because the vast majority of the payment that you're making goes to interest and not much goes to reduction of the principal. But with the power of math, and as you can see on this slide, the bulk of uh, that is going to change. If you stick around for long enough and you stick with your mortgage, um, you will see that that changes. Okay. Now let's take a look at some of these journal entries. I want to show you. November 15th, we can see that the $1,000 payment, 164 was for interest, 836 was to reduce the principal. So we're going to write a check. So we're going to credit cash for the full $1,000. $164 of it was interest expense. And the other $836, we are going to reduce the note payable with a debit. Now, 
the end of the year is December fifth is December thirty first. So let, got I gotta point something out here. All right, January fifteenth is when we make a thousand dollar payment, and we can see one hundred forty seven dollars is for interest, eight hundred fifty three dollars is for payment of principal. But between December fifteenth payment and January fifteenth payment, this is where our fiscal year end is, December thirty one. So effectively, what's happening is half of this $147 is for December, and the other half of this $147 is incurred in January. So if I am preparing financial statements as of December 3rd, half of that $147, or 74 just to, to round up, um, is actually incurred. As of December 31st, we need to record an adjusting entry to record interest expense debit of $74, and we have a liability of $74 in the interest payable. And then, of course, when we make our January 15th payment for $147, I'm sorry, for $1,000, $147 of it is interest, but really $74 of it is to debit the interest payable, and the other $73 is to debit interest expense for the first half of January and the other $853 is for um, the note payable. All right, so that is using an amortization table. Uh, now let me introduce you to another topic called bonds payable. Now a bond is basically when a company borrows money from the investing public. This is different than selling stock when you sell stock, uh, you're a company and you sell stock initially, the IPO, right, the initial public offering, that stock amount that you received, you don't have to pay that back. Those are owners of the company when you sell stock. Bonds, they are not owners of the company. As I said earlier, bondholders are creditors. They're going to expect their money back plus interest. All right, and so that is what a bond is. There is a contract that comes with bonds, and not only will the bondholders get paid back their principal at the end of the bond term, they will get paid interest over time. Okay, bond prices can sell. Bond prices can sell. Let me see, where are we? They can sell for the face amount, or they can sell for more or less than the face amount. First, let's take a look at a very simple example where we are issuing bonds at the face amount. On March 1st, 2018, Wells Corporation issues $1 million of 6% 20-year bonds payable dated March 1st. Interest is payable semi-annually each March 1st and September 1st. Assume the bonds are issued at face value. So on March 1st of 2018, you can see that we're issuing uh, bonds and we are collecting a million dollars from our new creditors, the bondholders. So we will increase cash with a debit and we will increase our liability bonds payable with a credit of a million dollars. This is on March 1st. September 1st is the first interest payment date. And remember our formula for interest is principal times rate times time. So if we do the math, the principal is a million dollars times the interest rate is 6% times time. Six months, six out of 12. Six twelfths, same as one half. If you do the math, it works out to $30,000. The journal entry, we're gonna increase our interest expense with a debit and we're writing interest payment checks. So we will credit cash for $30,000. Now that was on September 1st. Now, the next interest payment is not until March 1st of 2019, the next year. However, in this example, our fiscal year end is going to be December 31st. So what we need to do for our interest for our financial statements is we need to accrue interest from September 1 to December 31st. September 1 to December 31st is four months. So if we do our interest formula, principal of a million times rate, 6% times time, 4 twelfths, that works out to $20,000. Now, on December 31st, we're not writing a check for interest 
So instead of crediting cash, look at what we're crediting. We are crediting the liability, interest payable. That's what we want to do. This is an example of an adjustment at the end of the financial statement period. Now the next interest payment date is March 1st. And we already calculated earlier when we did the September 1st calculation that the interest payment check is coming to $30,000. That is the million dollars times 6% for half a year. Um, however, what are we paying on March 1st? Well, we are paying this $20,000 that we accrued as of December 31st. That's what this debit here is to the interest payable. Make that go away. And we have an additional expense of $10,000. What is that $10,000? Well, that $10,000 represents interest for the first two months of the fiscal year, January and February. So a million dollars times 6% for two months of the year, two twelfths. So remember, the whole idea of accrual accounting is to make sure that you are recording your revenues and expenses in the proper period. You record the revenues when you earn them, you record the expenses when you incur them. It does not matter when cash changes hands. That is the revenue recognition and the expense um, recognition rules. Now, in a, it's not always a perfect world. Sometimes we sell bonds in between interest payment dates. When bonds are sold in between interest dates, the bondholder is not only going to pay you the value of the bond, the face amount or whatever the present value is, they're also going to pay you the interest between the last interest payment date and when they bought the bond. Now, when they get to the first interest payment date, they're going to get all that interest back. Let me show you. So assume Wells Corporation issues $1 million of 6% bonds at par on May 1st. Now, if you go back a few slides, you remember that these bonds were issued, I should say they were dated on March 1st. So May 1st, what are we, March, April? We are two months after the March, March interest payment date printed on the bonds. So when we actually receive money from the bondholders, we are going to receive not only the million dollars for the face amount of the bonds, but also the amount of interest that they missed. They missed March and April. That is two months worth of interest. And we can do the math down here. We can see that's $10,000 of interest. So we are getting a full $1 million and $10,000. Now, some of you might be saying, no, that doesn't make sense. How can a bondholder buy a bond and they need to pay the company interest? That seems reverse, doesn't it? Well, yeah, it is kind of reverse. The $10,000 extra that the bondholders are paying us now, they're paying us two months worth of interest. But on the next interest payment date, and I'm going to show you in a minute, they're going to get six months worth of interest. But have they, have they held the bonds for a full six months? Nope, they've only held the bonds for four months, May, June, July, and August, because the next interest payment date is going to be on um, September the 1st. So here's the journal entry. On September 1st, when the interest payment checks are mailed of $30,000, this is a full six months worth of interest. Even though the bondholders only held the bonds for four months, so if you think about it, they paid us two months worth of interest. We're paying them back six months worth of interest. So on a net basis, they are getting four months worth of interest. There's a little typo here in the date column. Please make a note of this. This date should say September 1, not May 1. Okay. Now, we don't always sell bonds at a, the exact face amount. Sometimes we can sell bonds at a premium or a discount. Where am I going? I'm going too fast. Here we go. Okay, so if we sell bonds at a greater interest rate than the rest of the market, we can sell our bonds at a premium. 
which means that we receive more cash than the face amount of the bonds. And think about that logically. Forget debits and credits for a second. Doesn't that make sense to you? If I, if our company is issuing bonds at, at let's say, 6% interest rate, and everybody else in the world is issuing their bonds at, say, 5%, wouldn't you think we'd have a lot of demand? Yeah, we would. People would come knocking down our door for that extra 1%. And so we're able to sell our bonds at a premium, high demand. Now, let's take a look at the bottom of this slide. What if our interest rate is lower? It's below everyone else. Well, we're not going to have anyone wanting to buy our bonds, right? Um, so in order to generate interest, we need to sell our bonds uh, at a discount. That's basically selling them um, basically on sale, right? We are going to receive less cash than the face amount. Now, ultimately, at the end of the day, the customer, uh, the bondholder, they're going to get back the principal rate, regardless of how much they sent us in the begin with. And if our interest rate in the bond is the same as everybody else, um, there's no premium, no discount. We sell it exactly at face value. And that's exactly what I showed you in the slides already. All right, let's take a look at this example. Let's say Wells Corporation issues bonds on March 1st. Principal amount is a million dollars. We already saw that in our prior examples, but the issue price is 970,000. So we are issuing bonds at $30,000 less than the face value. This is an example of selling bonds at a discount. And let me show you the journal entry. Here we are on March 1st. We are receiving $970,000 from our bondholders, so we will debit cash for the 970000 Now let's move over to the credit. We have this liability. 30 years from now, we have to pay back the full million dollars, even though we only received 970000 The difference between the two, or $30,000, this is a discount on the bonds payable. This discount um, basically will be netted against the, the, the bond payable in the balance sheet. So you can see here's an excerpt of what the balance sheet would look like. In the long-term liability section on the balance sheet, we'd have our uh, $1 million bonds payable less the discount to give you a net carrying value of 970000 Over the period of time, we will amortize that discount. Effectively, what that means is by reducing the discount over time, we are going to add to the interest expense. So we are making um, 40 interest payment dates in this example. All right, so this was a, a note that was entered into in 2018. It is due back in full in 2038. That is 20 period, I'm sorry, 20 years. Interest is paid two times a year, so 20 years times two is 40 interest payments. So if our if our uh, discount is $30,000 and we're going to divide it among the 40 interest payments, that works out to $750 per period. That is straight line amortization. So when we make our interest payments on a semi-annual basis, so here's the first one on September 1st. We're going to write a check for cash, so I'll credit cash for $30,000. That doesn't change. But what does change is we now need to amortize the discount. If you go back a few slides, you will see that discounts have a debit balance. So to amortize them, to make them get smaller as time goes on, we will credit the discount account and using uh, straight line amortization that I showed you in the prior slide, that amounts to $750 in this example. The sum of the cash payment plus the amortization of the discount equals the bond interest expense. And you keep doing that again and again and again for 20 period, I'm sorry, for 40 interest periods. And finally, on March 1st, 2038, We've got our payback of the principal, which you see on your screen right now. Debit the bond payable and credit the cash. In addition, 
or I should say alternatively, that might be a little bit better, instead of issuing bonds at a discount, we can issue bonds at a premium. This means that we are going to receive more than what the face value is. So in this case, if the principal is a million dollars, but we actually received one million and thirty thousand, that means we sold our bonds at a thirty thousand dollar premium. Here is the journal entry. You can see we're receiving cash, so we will debit cash for one million and thirty thousand dollars. We're going to credit the bond payable for a million. Even though we received a million thirty thousand, we only have to pay back the million. All right, and the difference between the two in this case is a premium. Premiums work the opposite of discounts. Discounts have a debit balance and they reduce the carrying value of the bonds. Premiums actually have a credit balance and they increase the carrying value of the bonds. This is what the excerpt of the balance sheet would look like. If we were in the long-term liability section of the balance sheet, our bonds payable is a million. Now remember, liabilities have a credit balance. The premium also has a credit balance. So the carrying value is actually the sum of the two. And when we pay back our interest over time, we have to amortize the premium down to zero. Using straight line amortization, just like we saw when we amortized our discount, our $30,000 premium divided over uh, 40 interest payments or divided by 20 times a half. Another way to say that is divided by 40 interest payments. That works out to $750. So when we actually write our interest checks, <coughs> we still have the credit cash for the full $30,000, but we're going to amortize the premium, $750 per interest payment. Premiums have a credit balance, so to amortize them, we will debit them. And you can see the difference between the cash payment and the amortization of the premium equals the interest expense. So in summary, a discount actually adds to the interest expense above and beyond the cash payment, and the premium reduces interest expense above and beyond the cash interest payment. This makes sense if you really think about it. The premium is like extra money up front and it reduces our expense. The discount is we didn't receive enough money up front. So effectively, that's like hidden interest that we will add to the expense over time. Sometimes bonds could be retired early before we get to the maturity date. And this obviously would be stated in the bond agreement. <coughs> if we pay back, if the, the bond repayment amount is less than the carrying value, we have ourselves a gain on the early retirement of the bond. If we have to pay back more than the carrying value of the bond, then we actually will recognize a loss on the early retirement of bonds. Okay, estimated liabilities, like I said earlier, this is where we know a liability exists, but we don't know exactly what the dollar amount is. And the example I can give you is like when we sell a product or a service with a warranty. We know that certain customers are going to come back and uh, try to utilize the warranty, but we don't know exactly how many. So we have to do our best estimate. And then last but not least, we have something called a loss contingency. A loss contingency, a <coughs> little bit different than an estimated liability. An estimated liability, we know it exists. We just don't know how much. A loss contingency, we're actually not positive it exists, but we believe it exists. A loss contingency will be recorded when both of these criteria are present, when the loss is probable and the amount of loss can be reasonably estimated. Let me give you an example. Let's say we got into a lawsuit. 
Now, if your attorney says this lawsuit is frivolous, there's no way um, that this is going anywhere, is it probable that the loss has been incurred? Um, if you've got that expert opinion, probably you say no to that. And so we have no liability to record. However, if your attorney says, oh yeah, we definitely, we're definitely going to lose this lawsuit, but I don't know if the amount we're going to lose is a million dollars or $10 million. Well, it met criteria number one. It's probable the loss has been incurred, but we can't reasonably estimate the loss. Well, when they're both true, if your attorney in my example says, yep, most likely we're going to lose this lawsuit and it's going to be around $3 million. Well, we know that it's probable the loss has been incurred and we have a reasonable estimate. So when they're both present, we were actually going to record a liability. When one or the other is present, we will disclose in the footnotes. When these criteria are not met, loss contingencies are not formally recorded, but rather they are disclosed in notes to the financial statements if there is a reasonable possibility a loss has been incurred. Okay, and here's an example of a footnote disclosure for potential loss contingency. And you can see here, the company was named as a defendant in a $250 million patent infringement lawsuit. The company denies all charges. It's preparing its defense. It's not possible at this time to determine the ultimate legal or financial responsibility that may arise as a result of this litigation. All right, this is something where um, we know we might have a loss but um, it is impossible to tell whether it is probable. And um, therefore, what we do is we do not record anything, but we footnote it. This is something that is important to the readers of the financial statements. They certainly should know, um, but not enough for recording of the actual liability. Okay, um, that is it for this chapter. And we will see you in the next chapter.